On the 13th, Jerry got the orders to run a patrol. So we headed out and we headed toward this particular village. Uh, I remember when we got to, before we got to the village, there was there was a ramp leading into the village. I don't recall if there was water running under it or was a pool or what it was. It was just a small incline to get you off the rice paddies up into the village itself. It, it was made out of dirt. And somebody set off a concussion grenade. Uh, concussion grenade is a gr grenade that doesn't have any shrapnel in it. It just goes off, makes a loud noise. So that alerted us that there was some kind of a problem going on here. So we go past that, we get up into the village, and the first hoosh we run into is what appeared to be an NVA recruiting station. There were NVA flags all over the place, there was literature all over the place. And we saw that, and we, our, our, our senses were heightened to start with because of the grenade. Now we see this. Now we're more alert than we were before. We know there's, there's something going on here. So we start following the trail down through the village, and one of the guys happened to notice a cartridge belt that wasn't U.S. It was NVA. It was laying there. Okay. We didn't go and get it. We just left it there because we didn't know what it was. So the trail continued around that bend, it straightened out, and then it took another bend. And at that point, we had a man who was out in front. We heard fire. He opened fire on what he said was a group of eight to ten guys. He came back, and then we were, we were there trying to decide, Jerry's trying to decide what to do, and then the shooting started. So we were checking out the village. All of a sudden, here bursts of gunfire, you know? So, you know, and so I go running up uh, toward the front there and uh, and uh, Spalding standing back there and he's and he's changing magazine and and he says, there's about 12 of them up there, you know, so they probably were hanging around out front there, you know, off, off the trail when they were spotted by uh, uh, Spalding and he opened up on them. And so they knew we were there. And and so what happens that they just start firing down the uh, uh, the trail there, and all of a sudden, you know, this bullet flying by, flying over top of me right here, you know, and and you know the trees that were up there, branches are falling down on us and everything like that, and yeah, just just this hill to the left, take the left flank, Ramallah take the right flank, you know, and so they just, and then what happens? I hear a burst of gunfire. Uh, from my left right there. And then uh, I hear Corman up, Corman up, you know, so thinking, my thinking now is, you know, what do we do next? You know, and my, my de I, I decided we're gonna, we're, we're gonna attack forward, you know. Just then I, I hear Doc Butler says, I need a medevac, I need a medevac. And then he says, he says, Bax Blackson's gonna die if we don't get him out of here. 
life, and if he's gonna die, we don't get him a chopper. It means none of that. So I, I called for a, uh, a foot, for them to pull back. Jerry had me take my fire team off to the right and set up kind of a blocking position to see what's going on in front of us. What's interesting about a firefight? You're here, and the only thing you know about this fight is this. You have no idea what's going on over here. You have no idea what's going on over there. You watch your area. Each individual man has got his own area to watch, and that's all they know. <laughs> Heckle jumps up, stands up with his M60 machine gun, and starts firing right down there. Just, he's just firing away. I can see the bullets flying by him, and you know, and one bullet hits hits him right in the leg and splits open. You know, I saw. The uh, utility just split open, you know, and the blood wow. come right down. Give me a grenade, you know. That's right, he's in the zone right now, man. He's gonna, he's gonna kill them all, you know. He just pulls it, pulls, you know, runs for it and throws the grenade, you know. And then, you know, we, we start backing down the trail. You know? Echo and I were, were the last guys coming down the trail. And then when we get out of the trail, I run back up toward the front to find out where, you know, where we're going. At this time, I'm still thinking it's nothing more than a squad. And now that you know we open up on them, they they were opening up on us. They are gone. And so I, I call in the middle back. I you know I string out the guys in a three hundred and sixty degree. Yeah, and all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> see mortars start start exploding around us. You know, fact of the matter, you couldn't even see them. <laughs> that was they were that close. You know, so we were next to a cane field, so we go into the cane field for cover. And they're dropping mortars on us. So now we're in a well. We, I want to. I'm, I'm using the word panic, but I don't mean panic. We're concerned <laughs> that something big is going on. And we were pinned there for. I'm going to get to half an hour. We had one guy took a round on the chest. And he died. Uh, nobody else got hurt at that point in time. And when they start hitting us with mortars, is when I. Um... I told a radio man, you know, uh, we better get us some uh, reinforcement out here, you know. I think and that was when I really accepted the fact that I'm not going to make it out of here. It's really kind of funny, you know, when, when you accept death. It's, it's kind of like, you know, a, a second becomes like a minute. A minute becomes like an hour. It's like you can hear everything, you can see everything. Everything's like really your senses are just kind of really enhanced and all that. And I'm not afraid. Yeah. You know, I can think very clearly. The time when, when when they were hitting us with the mortars on both on both sides, you know, and they're exploding. But luckily, they're not exploding um, right on our position. They're, you know, they're landing around the position, but they we were here. Mortar rounds started to drop, so we moved over here. The other side of the field, mortar rounds started to drop over there, and we moved back again. And I, I, you know, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if it's just a figment of my imagination, but that's what it seemed like. <laughs> Wherever we moved, they were dropping mortars on. You know, I, I was standing there, and I don't know what I was doing. You know, and then somebody yelled, "It's coming for us!" You know, I go, "Holy shit!" So I started running. Uh, uh, yeah, we're all spreading out. You know, running, and. I, I, I must have gotten the furthest away, or I ran the fastest out of, uh, out of the way because it just and then because I hit the ground and I'm down on the ground hoping that I could crawl underneath my helmet when the when it just goes boom right up right where I was standing, you know. All of them, I hit the ground and I was looking back like that. I see, I see an explosion to go off, you know. So, and then then you could hear and feel things flying through the air, you know. So then I, 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 I feel something like running down my leg, you know, to, so I reach back there, you know, find out what the heck. And then I came back and I had blood on my hand, you know, what happened is I got hit. And, but at the same time, what I didn't realize, the shrapnel had also uh, tore through my, my, my jungle utility, hit my helmet, you know, then I ran back there. And that's when, you know, I ran into, you know, Corman was down, he was down on the ground, Doc Butler was down on the ground. My grenadier was down on the ground. A radio man was, uh, uh, was standing up. He was bleeding. And then uh, that's when, you know, I saw Doc, uh, Doc Butler, you know, and he was just 
still bleeding everywhere, blood everywhere, you know. And I, I was thinking, I, I got, I got to be able to bandage him up, but you know, it's like where, you know. And so I'm, 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 I'm asking him, Doc, where does it hurt the most, you know? And that's when he tells, when he tells me, whispers in me, in my ear, to save the bandage for the guys, you know. And at that time, then I went and check, check on Riley. I knew I, I had to check out, find out what the hell's, what, how was everybody else anyway. So uh, Chuck was there, so I told Chuck to take charge, you know, with, about these guys, get them taken care of, and then also, you know, get them to a safe area, move them to a safe area. So, you know, because they're out in the open now, just pull them back in, in, into the tree line. I went and checked on Blackston, and he was, he was still breathing. And then, you know, as I leaned down to, lay, as I, you know, knelt down beside him, you know, I could hear that death rattle. Blackston face was all gray, you know. You, if you've been around long enough, you can tell when death is, is approaching, is coming. You can see that in the per person's face. And I knew, I, I knew he was, he was going to die. He was, I knew he died at that moment. So, you know, I, I, I closed his eyes. Yeah, and said, I, can't, I, can't, I don't have time to grieve right now. I feel bad. I got to do something here. The grenadier was down, so I took his M79 and I was going to see if I could knock out the uh, the, the mortar. So anyway, I, I, I took the, the M79 there and tried to uh, put uh, and start putting a couple of rounds, or several rounds into the area. I fired from one position several times and I moved because I didn't want them zeroing in on me, so I moved. 10 yards, fire from another position. But I was a know. bird dog in the area, and they heard about us, and they came over, and they, so they brought in jets. The bird dog Cessna in the, in, in the area, right there, circling, you know? But I knew their call sign was gun smoke. You know, I, I was standing. So we were taking fire from a wood line ahead of us. Jerry called in the jets, and he told them where he wanted them to drop the, the bombs. He dropped them off to our left, maybe 100 meters. All right, and called Jerry's question. You dropped them in the wrong place. He says, no, they were a group of about 50 guys coming towards you, and he had, he had hit them. So if, if if he hadn't dropped those bombs there, I don't know what would have happened. They would have been 50 against 10. Yeah, right. And that's the area where I suspect that the mortars were in that area, right there, where you drop it off. And um, he hit the tree line that's next to it, and that was across from it, you know. And that's when I said, Gunsmoke, damn it, you dropped it on the wrong tree line, you know. I was screaming at him because I, I felt kind of frustrated because this guy's mortaring me, my guys are getting hit. You know, and, and it's like, we're so helpless out here. We, you know, we need, we need you know, take that fucking mortar out. So when he says, you're 60, Victor Charlie headed your way, <laughs> I think I got more problems just the mortar. with negative Mike 3 Bravo. There's approximately 60, Victor Charlie headed your way. You know, I said, Roger, just keep them coming. <laughs> there was a reason why he dropped it over there, and it was a good reason. I mean, you know, because they had a surround, you know. I'm not sure how Jerry got the word. I'm sure I'm assuming he got all over the radio that the company was in the area. And we just kind of fell back, retraced our steps back into the village. And at some point we tied up with them. Then during that period of time, I, I remember calling in Jim Hastings uh, squad, you know, the yeah. and I come in with Hastings squad and calling uh, his squad and talking to the platoon commander and telling him, you know, I need some help over here. I don't, I, I don't even know where they're at. All I just, all, I'm just in contact with them over the radio. I could hear Rick, Rick Johnson saying, hey, he goes, we're pinned down here. We can't get to you. You know, you, you're gonna have to try and hold out there. Yeah. So, you know, what happens then is just start, um, you know, rallying and pulling all the guys together. I, I decided, Got to move our guys, the wounded and whatever. We got to move them uh, out of that area. So what I did is I took the guys and moved them out toward uh, where I thought uh, the Hastings squad was at. Uh, but the rest of the company came in to reinforce us. 
at the time we didn't know it, but we ran into a, a major NVA unit. They had mortars, they had machine guns, they had everything you could say. Yes, on the radio, Lieutenant Johnson called for me. So Chuck Hill and I went running up toward where Lieutenant Johnson was. And he was down at the edge. He was down at the end of the trail, right where we start, where we start going up the trail. He was down there. That's that's the first I see him. And, you know, we had and Marines were, you know, were just on both sides of the trail uh, laying down, you know, all along the, all along the trail. And they, They were coming. Back. They were coming to reinforce us. And what happened? And there? they walked into an ambush. Their point man, who I believe was Shaw, was hit. He was down out in the open, and they lost a couple more guys trying to get him out of there. They, uh, Rick said, "See what you can they, do." I think he told me Shaw was pinned down. Shaw was in a crossing squad. Right? I knew that was third squad. I knew that was that was the third squad because I recognized the members of the guys. Because McCrossin was supposed to leave for R and R, you know, I had I had said goodbye to him and told him, don't don't get the claps and all that. So you know, and I was thinking to myself that I sure I'm glad Max's not out here you know, and that he's gone. Um, so sure I was the point man. Mac was corporal. Mac is a squad leader. So he has. Shaw sure, going out as point man. Jerry's squad was out, <clears throat> and then Mac's squad went as a reactionary. And that's when Shaw, sure, they must have missed where Jerry was. We knew Jerry's squad got ambushed, and then Mac's squad went out, but he stayed back because he was going to go with the next chopper that came out to go an R and R. So his squad went out with Shaw. Sure, his point man, like I said, and then they get ambushed. But I don't think they found Jerry's squad. You know, we went out. Mac wasn't going to go. He wasn't supposed to go, and he argued with Lieutenant Johnson, and they finally let him go. So Mac had been there, like I said, the day be you know the day before. So he led. I followed. I was right behind him. So we're out there. We find. Uh, Blackston, he's dead. We called in a medevac, put him in a chopper. Then we kept on going, and all the guys from Max Squad were lined up along this little trail hall, hunkered down. So it was Mac and me, and I think Tony Camacho and Jim Elliott behind him. I remember Mac and I stopping, you know, we looked, we could see Shar and Jefferson. We stood up, went from here to there, you know, thinking I can see Mac get spun around, just like that. It turned, you know, and then I, <clears throat> I got hit right here. My rifle went flying. I got right. I still got shrapnel in here. Okay. And it just like getting hit with a sledgehammer, you know. And it was it was only a carbine, but it freaking knocked me on my ass. And <clears throat> Mac, he's fell. In the trench, and there was a little trench, there, and I fell into it right behind him. You know, so, you know, they're, they're still shooting, and every time I put my head up to try to see if I can see my rifle, it was like I had a weed whacker over my head, you know, and I'm saying, well, like that, I'm gonna wait a minute, and I wait, and every time I lift my head up, they keep shooting. So they, they must have gone back. Down there from the spider holes. So Tony comes up and I goes, Go get Mac, he's more fucked up than me. And so he went up, whatever he did, he came back, opened my pants and put a battle dressing on my leg. And uh, I don't remember how long it was, all of a sudden, then the second platoon came, came up, and Wayne got Mac, threw him over his shoulder, took off. Came back and I remember laying in the trench and then 
plane, picking me up, throwing me over his shoulder, and put maybe five feet, and I went flying through the air. And I get hit two more times here, and then, you know, my arm. And I remember, felt like, you know, they tell you about when you're going to shock, you feel like you're going to swallow your tongue. And then I don't remember how long we were there. And then the boss came and, and picking me up. We were, eventually, you know, I kept passing out. Chuck Hill was behind me, and he said he he saw you know the second platoon squad leader. The second platoon squad leader is called Horse. That wasn't his real name. We just call him Horse because of the fact he 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 was big and he was strong and he was tough. I mean, he was one mean guy too. You know, I mean, uh, him and Spare and what and somebody and then they they all had uh, uh, nicknames for their squad. The, 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 and then Horse was the squad leader, Dirty Dozen, because I remember seeing him. And I think that squad, they all carry machetes. So I kind of... When we came up, who, whoever was in charge yeah. told me. And all I could say, Lord, what did I do or not? Because I, I was always, you know, I opened my mouth. And I thought I had done say something. Because we had laid there for a whole hour or two hours that because when they call me up there with it and here we are here and we such and such and I and I told him I said sir let me go and assess this situation and then I'll let you know something because I, I don't know who's caught or uh, he said uh Say, what are you doing here? I said, well, the, the big man sent me here to find out what the hell going on. So he said, I got two wounded men or somebody said that. So I said, okay. So I crawled down there and seen two wounded men. So I went and got, I don't know who I got first, but I got somebody out and, and killed him and gave him to some, somebody took him, whoever it was. Then I went back and got the other one. I snatched him up by his uh, flight jacket. Well, I was big and strong then. I snatched him up by his flight jacket. I think he was hit twice or something like that. The guy was shooting, uh, 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 he, he wasn't playing fair. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I got him out and uh, then we moved back. So Lieutenant Johnson had told me to you know, go up, front, see, do whatever, do whatever can, or help out whatever I can, you know. So, so I ran up the, uh, the from side to side uh, with Chuck behind me all the way up to the front, you know, <clears throat> and I was, I was, and I was behind the machine gunner uh, who was uh, um, Tony Camacho. That's he was one of the guys who, who along with Hastings and and uh, McCrossan, were going to try to run out there and get uh, get Shaw, because what happened was Shaw was out there, and he was, you know, he, and they were shooting him to making him a you know scream, you know, and and so, and and he was point man, and then he was wounded, and then he was being kind of tauntingly. Right, to, to draw guys in. Yeah, not to kill him, but just to shoot him to make him scream, you know? And so you guys could hear him screaming. Oh, yeah, right, because you know? they knew that, you know, we they knew we would come, you know? So they were just waiting, waiting for for us to, to, to do that. And then, you know, our, our guys, you know, like Mac and Haste and Jim Hastings and, Tony Camacho, you know, these are, these are some 
hard hardcore guys i mean and they they're not going to you know let them let another marine get jim and mac and tony they had been together you know since you know since uh, uh de soto you know so they they knew each other they've been they were the guys that have been there the longest you know um, so they charge out there yeah they charge out there and that's when um, and you know and then that's that's where mac you know he his recklessness kind of got you know got him in trouble there you know i mean you know ideally what happens you would just throw smoke out there you know and then go out and uh, uh, undercover smoke because because you know that's what they're doing well they either didn't have smoke and it, that may have happened because we've been out in the field for so long, so we 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 want to resupply or anything like that. But you know what they did was, you know, they they, they were on, on the ground. They, they end up taking off the you know the their flak jackets and all that. You know, took off all their you know bandoliers, gears, and all that just to be quick and nimble. Right, exactly. And then and then he, and so you know they yeah you know, they were down. And then when and they came up out of the you know came up. And the minute they came up, they got they, they, they got shot, you know, like Mac. Mac got shot right here. Bullet went through here, and came out in the back right here, you know. And he so he, what happened is he the only way that happens when he was he he got hit when he was coming up like this, and then Jim Hastings got. A shot in the, uh, uh, in the arm, you know, just blew his arm off, you know. Just, you had just met up with the lieutenant being told to head out there to see what right, what's right? going on. Yeah, right. I don't even know Matt's there. I don't know what, who, I don't know what the hell happened, you know. All I, and nobody knew is just basically squad leader up. No. So, you know, when I got, and I, I only found out, well, so anyway, you know, when I, when I got up there and, and I was right up toward the front and that was Tony. Was was down on the ground. Uh, he, he had the machine gun, um, pointed down that trail, and so that was where they had gotten shot coming out of. So I was right at the the head of the trail there, you know, or the top where the where, and then out there Shaw was laying out there, not very far away, maybe ten, ten yards, ten feet, ten feet. wasn't that far away, you know, but you know that was a killing zone between him. And, from where we were, so I was, I was laying behind uh, 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 Tony, and then the, the the word came past the guys of the gear, the guys who got wounded's gear, uh, back, you know. So, so Tony is where he's at is where Hastings and Mac and all that took out all their gears and all that. So he's laying down in front, and I'm right behind him. So he's sixteen back to me like this, you know. So I'm, and then from here I'm passing as the Chuck Hill, who's behind me, you know, all laying down in kind of like a little trench uh, alongside the, uh, the, the trail. And then all of a sudden he passed, passed back the helmet, and then I recognized the helmet because it was Max. So I knew that was his helmet, and I, and I said, to, and I said, Tony, I said, it, it's Mac. I said, is Mac out here? And he goes, yeah, he got wasted, you know. And I thought, oh, I fear what, you know, that. But, you know, there's nothing you can do about it at that time. You know, by that time, they were being taken out to the uh, medical And back. this is truly heroic, what, how they were rescued. You're right. Exactly. That's where Spain, spare. So, yeah, right. He didn't have to, he didn't, he didn't have to be out there, you know. It was, first of all, it wasn't his platoon that was up there. And second, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't his guys that were being shot, shot there. But he went up there. He was, you know, well respected, well thought of. And I was told that he first picked up Macross and carried him back, uh, and then I, I, and I think probably gave him the horse to carry the rest away. He went back to get Jim, and picked Jim up, uh, and that's and then he was starting to head, head back down the trail. And that's when uh, you know they got shot multiple times, and, uh, and then Jim got hit. I think really three or four times more. In the I remember somehow I ended up in the area where they were bringing all the wounded. It was like a triage area. There was three, four, maybe five guys there that had been hit. Gene McCrossin was one of them. Jim Hastings was another. Uh, I think Spear at that time it was going in. 
grabbing guys and pulling them out. And the last time he went in, he took a shot. I believe he got hit in the chest and he eventually died. But when somebody does something like that, they're gonna run up there with 14 people shooting at you, grab this guy and drag him out of there. You're going on instinct and training. Well, no, I remember waking up and I was covering a poncho up to my head and there was about seven or, <clears throat> seven or eight of us laying there in this field, covered up waiting for the medevac. And I sat up once, I looked up and I could see Wayne propped up against a tree and, you know, he had the round went through my arm and into his back. And I guess they had him up because, you know, he, he was bleeding internally. So and then the next thing I remember was getting thrown on the chopper and then passing out again and then waking up. And all of a sudden, Wayne is lifting his head off of my face, saying, am I going to die? Am I going to die? And I just, you know, said, hang in there, we're almost there. And I don't know where we were. And then he just clapped in my face, died. Wow. And then the next thing I remember is being in the Italian aid station, laying on a gurney. I look up again, about four or five gurneys in front of me, I can see Mac. You know, and that was the last I saw him. And then, <clears throat> I was the only one who was ambulatory. Everyone else had got wounds, and they flew me out to the sanctuary. And I remember landing on the ship, and they stand going there, and there's a priest, and I'm so friggin' high right now. And going, oh, Father, yeah, I was an altar boy for five years and stuff, you know. <laughs> and then the next thing I remember laying on a, in the operating room. And I just felt like I had a, it was so bad. I remember this woman trying to hold my dick over to the side so I wouldn't pee on myself. Then I just remembered a mask coming on my face and then going, boom, I was out. You know, and I woke up one of them. So this is the USS Sanctuary, the ship that they used as a medical ship? Yep. On there for about a month in traction. You know, by that time, Spare was gone, Jim Hastings was gone, Matt was gone, you know, it was, just, it was me and Tony and Chuck and some other guys that were right up in the front there, you know, um, trying to decide how we were going to get Spare out, you know, because, you know, what, because now we knew that they were just waiting for, who, that they could see, they obviously could see see us and we couldn't see them you know and, and that's how they were able to shoot or hit mac and spare and hastings you know so we couldn't get up and we couldn't move out there you know it was getting dark and um and then what happened then is we we crawled out when it got dark we we started crawling out out toward where shaw was you know and it was i think it was four of us Right. By that time, he was, you know, you, and you dead. knew it was a recovery and not a right. Recovery. I knew we knew that, he, you know, right. Because, you know, he, he, you know, he stopped you know, calling and screaming. I think, I, I think probably when he got hit, it was, must have been around two, two thirty. And by the time we got to him, I think it was probably about five, you know. Um, so, you know, we crawled out there and, you know, they, and nobody shot at us, you know, so, and nobody, nothing, nothing happened, you know, so they evidently, they, they pulled out when it was dark. So, you know, we dragged back, put him on poncho and then kind of wrapped it up and cut down a branch, you know, because they, choppers wouldn't, choppers couldn't come in. It was either too dark or they didn't want to or whatever, you know. Because uh, Jim, I think, and Spare and McCrossin were on the last chopper out of there. And then what we did was we went back to our base camp, walked, <laughs> walked a while, two miles or whatever. The, the other aspect of that that's pretty tragic is you've recovered your Marine, he's dead. But because there's no priority to saving him, 
the military is not going to risk a helicopter to take a dead body. Right. So you have to hump him out of the bush. Right. And carry, and carry. So we carried him out of the bush, you know, back to, uh, back to. Uh, so you create a litter with a poncho and a pole? Yeah. Basically. That's what we did. We had a poncho, wrapped him up in a poncho, you know. And didn't want the guys to see him because, you know, he got. You know, got shot up with holes, you know, holes and, you know, it's just... The dignity of it, too. Right, just, just feel... exactly. You know? So, you know, it's... So we carried him back, and when we got back to the, where our base camp was, you know, then uh, started checking out, you know, trying to find out what happened, who's who, who's who's alive, who's, who's, you know, who's been injured and all that. And the corpsman said... Uh, he goes, we need to medevac you, get you out on a chopper. And I said, well, what for? He said, you know, you could, um, he said, you can get this infected and it'll be really bad, you know? And I, and I told him, I, I'm not, I'm not leaving, <laughs> you know? Rick Johnson, the platoon commander said, you got, you know, you gotta leave. I said, Lieutenant, I said, we, I can't leave because what happened? We've lost two of the squad leaders. I'm now the senior squad leader. I mean, and we're right in the middle of offensive going on. And, you know, we have new guys. So anyway, I I, I told Rick, you know, I said, look, I, I'm okay. It's mm -hmm. infected. I'll, I'll go. I mean, he, you know, he realized that makes sense. We had lost some of our best guys, you know. I mean, that we all depended on. And then I was the, from the junior squad leader. I now became the senior squad leader. After that, it 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 just stops. It's it's crazy the way it it, it it starts. There's a long fight, and then it just stops. <laughs> 